there is one thing similar about all of it, that all eye contact is about value. Our eyes go to the things of value. What do the political classes, what do they want from you? Yeah, that's really interesting. Same, same as any other human being. What they should be mindful of in Zoom video meetings. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Perception of me and what I need to do to cause your perception of me to be one of confidence. And, and then I'm concerned about how do I get you to go and tell other people? It's like, no, your, your, your family and your family's family and, you know, those, that eons of power counts for nothing on this land. And we can get across an idea about you that fits the idea of, for the country and it can be in the weave of the cloth because they will see they will see that and it will have meaning. It will have meaning. It but I view confidence in a slightly different way than some might. Especially in the, the Prince Andrew interview yes. with Emily Nicholas. Um, yes. going, they're going to be nothing. They're not a threat. They're not a friend. They're not a sexual partner. I'm indifferent to them. Mark Bowden, thank you so much for joining me. I'm delighted to be speaking with you. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. My pleasure, Connor. It's great to be here. Love what you do. And it's a it's a real honor and pleasure for me to have a chat with you. It really is. Let's find out a little bit more about your origin story, who you are. Tell us where are you, where are you from, Mark? Where did you grow up? Yeah, so I I grew up in Northampton, which is 60 miles north of London, up the M1. It's a little um kind of dank market town, uh, was the shoe capital of the world at, at, at one point. It was actually going to be the the capital of London at one point in its history, and then it burnt wow. down. Uh, I think somebody probably set the fire, actually. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was going to have a major university, um, yeah. but Oxford and Cambridge um, petitioned, I think, Henry VIII not to give it a royal seal of approval to be, you know, the, the third Oxford and Cambridge. So, so it got, it's a massive town, but it got set as this little market town. It was the centre of the Civil War in, in the UK. You got writers there like Alan Moore. I don't know whether you know, you know, Alan Moore, but I mean, you know, renovated comic books. He's the guy who wrote the, the Joker, as we know the Joker now. Very dark. Wow. So, so Northamptonshire and Northampton is 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 quite Gothic rock. Gothic, came from yeah. Our house yeah. came from. We're a, we're a, a band just down the road from me. You know. Um, wow. So, so it's it 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 was quite a a dark um, place. I then moved to uh, London uh, to study performing arts, and and I got really engaged in visual theatre. Which then suddenly became the, the 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 toast of of London and the world and Europe, you know, doing theatre without words, which suited me fine because I was dyslexic and learning lines. Not that I couldn't do it, but it was super hard work. I mean, mm -hmm. like super hard work. I'd have to sit in the bath for hours just focusing on the script and, and just trying to trying to learn, learn, learn. You know, get them in my head. So it used to super annoy me when people would turn up to the set and not know their lines. It's like do they know how how many hours it took me to <laughs> to, to know mine perfectly? So so anyway, um, I I got into visual theatre, mask theatre, uh, especially uh, mm. trained with with the masters of that all over Europe. Became very adept in it myself, and that was really the transition to then training other people, not only in theatre. So I I trained people across the drama schools in um, and acting schools across the world. Um, but I'd go and fix shows, I'd direct shows, uh, work in TV and film, perform as well. But then people would go, well, can you do that for us in business? And can you do that for us in politics? So Brilliant. that's where the transition yeah. came of, wow. can I, let's just say, you know, choreograph mm. other people in order to get the message across in a silent way. And we all know from our understanding of propaganda, really, how important the silent message uh is you know it's interesting that that um uh you know hitler's triumph of the will you know lenny reifenstahl is pretty much a silent film mm. you know pretty much chaplin mm. ultimately you know it's a silent film to get that message across to the german people uh in a in a fundamentally uh aggressive and powerful way so i've been obsessed with the visual image 
Uh, <laughs> that makes sense to you, Connor. It does, yeah, yeah, it does absolutely. Um, I love the 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 transition from acting and performance into making that transition can be challenging because people often assume there are assumptions we make about actors, there are some assumptions we make about dramatists that maybe they wouldn't fit into the corporate space. Weird, weird assumptions. Mm. Uh, look at American politics. Mm. How many actors, performers have actually ended up being president in reality or shooting one? Yeah. You know, <laughs> how many? Um, uh, look at European politics, playwrights, performers, comedians, actors mm. running the countries, you know, creating performers, writers, creating the the ethos of of how they think the country um should Sco should be especially in eastern uh, europe former soviet blocks you got you got writers and performers who've decided how the countries have gone so we are the we are ultimately often the progenitors of the of the central ideas that are going to push a country forward mm. and then often the the actors <laughs> that then perform those leadership roles mm. in order to push countries forward. So I always find that thing of, well, you know, you're just an actor. What would you know? It's like everything about this. Like, yeah. Everything. Yeah. Nations begin as stories. And uh, my professor Shane Amara, I, I spoke to him recently about his book, um, Talking Heads. He, he, he outlines how they, they begin as stories and the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, did you move to Canada at some point, Mark? Was that a yeah. was that, that that was a big move for you, right? Yeah, it was a big was a big move. It was a big move, and and we kind of had it in mind. We bought myself and Tracy, uh, who actually co-wrote Truth and Lies with me, uh, fourth book, and and we're married, and we've been partners in 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 life and in business for you know, gosh, uh, over a quarter of a decade or so. Um, so. That's a quarter of a decade, quarter of a century. Um, so so we bought a place in Canada because you could at the mm. time. You probably remember something of London prices, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I lived in London for three years, yeah. I remember okay, so well. you know, yeah, yeah, you know what it's what it's like. Great, greatest city in, in the world, but tough mm. to live in. I mean, you you know it well, Connor. You when you're in London, you are competing against everybody on the planet. Like everybody comes to London at every in every area to go, can I play London and can I succeed in London? So you're up against the best of the best in the world, which means which means you you know, you can come away from London and into other markets and it feels like a knife, hot knife through butter mm. because you're just used to working and competing at such a such a rate but it's it's hard and a lot of the people that we knew were, were leaving London and going out into the counties and you know away from London to have their kids we were having kids and and we bought a place in Canada because you could in downtown Toronto incredible place beautiful place never lived in it just mm. owned it because you could own it you know wow, yeah. and then we're like okay well we'll go and go there so I landed on the tarmac really knowing nobody apart from Tracy and, <laughs> and started and then got you know full head into this idea of how do I really take all this expertise from, you know, how you, how you tell stories with pictures mm. and how you move people with moving pictures, mm. take that fully into, into business and politics in Canada. And I hadn't mm. really realized that I was right on the American border. <laughs> and so <laughs> And so very soon I was going into America and doing this. And very soon the majority of the work was actually in the U S which, as you know, mm. I mean, that's a market. Mm. I mean, that is, you know, arguably the, the biggest market and, and, and a very different attitude. Mm. Um, you know, you know, you know, the UK attitude, you know, the Irish attitude, which is different from the UK, uh, you know, attitude mm. in many many good good ways <laughs> you know but but the uk attitude is very very closed mm. very closed the american attitude is super open you know once you've proved yourself on any level they're like well let's have have that and buy lots of it and let's yeah. go let's run with that so yeah. it was uh you know canada has been a, an incredible uh opportunity um I noticed as you're talking there, and let, let, let's talk a little bit about body language because you are yeah. undoubtedly one of the one of the world's great experts in it. Right? Thank you. You 
you use your your hands, you use your body, right? How important is and you make these gestures and it's it's clear, but I've been watching you for so long now, I can see the the, the thought process and the craft behind what you do. What can you tell yeah. me about using the body as part of communication? Yeah, so look, your brain, the audience's brain, everybody's brain, my brain is looking out for the visual cues in order to work out, can we trust the message or not? And it's looking for, first of all, one of the items is it's looking for, does the visual message support the verbal message? It, and we call that congruence. Is it congruent? Hmm. Well, one of the ways I can make it very congruent is, for example, when I say the word congruent, I'm batoning on it. I'm moving at the same time as the word. I did that mm. just that same time as the word. And your brain goes, well, the movement fitted the word in rhythm. Therefore, we can trust the word. Well, can you? I mean, that's an interesting piece of logic that your brain is making naturally. You didn't learn to do that. You're, you have a, let's call it a pre-programming, although the brain is nothing like a computer. You've got a pre-programming to say, if the rhythm of the movement is the same as the rhythm of the words, trust the words. Well, now I know that about your brain, about my brain, about our brains. Mm. I can capitalize on that. I can make sure that I'm more rhythmically accurate so that you'll trust me more. And I can also go, if I see you do movements which are out of sync with your words, should I trust those words? But I can also go, should I critically think this and think, is there, are there other reasons why you wouldn't quite be in sync? And it's not about deception. It's mm. not about lies. It's about other stresses and pressures that are going on around you. And I can start to, for want of a better word, interrogate you, interview you about that hmm. so look yeah i am um i'm very clear about my gestures now you might think okay well then mark are you thinking about your gestures all the time well no because that'd be too hard that's neural overload you know i i can't do that but i've trained myself to be very free with my body hmm. yeah so that when i get the impulse to move when my brain is going hey m you know unconsciously move your hand i don't hold it back i let it go so I'm more likely to make bigger, bolder gestures and more of them because I haven't locked my body down. Now, there's there might be reasons at some points where I might choose to lock my body down. But again, now it's a, a conscious choice, not an unconscious choice. So mm. I think, you know, to, to, to tie this one up, Connor, I'm trying to make conscious choices about the themes of my gestures, the areas of it, rather than individual things. Like, for example, when I said individual things, I made a nice pinch gesture there, which mm. shows your brain I'm able to use fine tools. Mm. We can use needle and thread, which is a super fine tool. And your brain responds to that. Now, I didn't think about using that fine tool gesture. But I've I've made sure if I want to make it, I'll really make it and I'll allow you to see it. So showing you everything mm. is, is a choice that I'm making. I hope, hope that makes sense to you, Connor. It does. Yeah. Um, do you find opening up your body like that and using these these gestures improves your confidence and gets energy flowing through your body? Is that part of it as well? Yeah. Look, I, I, yes, it does. I think, yes, it does. But I view confidence in a slightly different way than some might mm. and, and this will be a bias in the way i'm trying to help people and train them is that i'm not worried about my confidence i'm worried about your confidence as the viewer i'm gonna i set up a, a model that says um i mean i don't walk around the planet going hey i think i'm really confident <laughs> but you might walk around the planet and you might even say to somebody hey you should get mark on on your podcast He's really confident. It's like, I didn't make up that idea. You made up that idea. And mm. it's important that you think I'm confident because when you think I'm confident, you start listening to what I have to say in a whole different manner. Mm. So then the question becomes, how, what do I need to do in order to cause your brain to go, Mark is confident? Which is, a, I mean, you don't know. 
but you mm. went is mark is confident like that's uh that's a bold statement to make so bold that you tell other people so i'm concerned about your perception of me and what i need to do to cause your perception of me to be one of confidence and and then i'm concerned about how do i get you to go and tell other people that now look end of the day i could disappoint you could say hey you've got to get mark on your podcast he's super confident about what he says you'll love it and then i go on and i'm an utter disaster and then your friend goes connor who was that that's a chimp <laughs> you <laughs> so look you cannot disappoint people mm. but at the same time you don't have to be that thing in order for other people to make you that thing mm. and, and and to be made that thing and then to deliver, to delight them, that for me is is more than good enough. More than more than good enough. I don't want to disappoint. I do want to delight, but that doesn't mean I have to be it from moment one. You think um, when I think of confidence and what we're taught, there's a cultural aspect to this because being static and inert and inward. Yeah. I'm thinking like Michael Corleone and The Godfather. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. This kind of old school, the, the, the quietest and the most silent in, in Japanese culture, Asian culture, the quietest person in the room, the one that makes the least amount of um, noise. Is yeah. The, the most authoritative and the most confident. That's the yeah. opposite. So yours is yours is slightly performative. Yes. Well, look, let's think about those cultures. Japanese culture. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. Yes. American culture. Hundreds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you may you may think that there's there's set hierarchies in America, and there are, of course, there are, mm. but they're not thousands of years old, not like they're thousands of years old in across Europe. And so, and so, how how does the Japanese person get to be so still and still in command? The the owner the 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 eons long ownership of power. Mm. Which we, you put that mm. person in America, they're dead in the water. They mm. will not get a word in. It's like it's like no, your 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 family and your family's family and you know those that eons of power counts for nothing on this land. So you don't like you got to come in and you got to put your iron rod in the ground and hammer it in and defend that iron rod to keep your ground to to get to have your homestead mm. right now. You, you're you know you only have that power right now because your families you know won it with with blades you know, mm -hmm. a thousand years ago and good yeah good on them great fantastic mm. but that's that culture will not uh transfer so we've always got to look at uh, look culture's interesting because we all have the same instincts okay we all have the same instincts and we we uh, you know, we don't learn those instincts. They they rise to the top in us. They 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 have a development. We all have the the um, instinct to walk, and we develop that. And some people are developmentally challenged around that, and they don't walk as early, but they end up walking. Uh, you know, they get there in the end. Some some very small percentage don't, and they need to be looked after. But ultimately. We, we will get there. What culture does is to turn up the volume or turn down the volume on our instincts, tending to fit something that the land that that culture first developed in, the land required of, of that in order for social groups to survive in that land. Certain instincts needed turning down and certain instincts needed turning up. So if you take one culture and you put that behavior in another culture it's like it's it's alien it's a mm. different planet well why because you know um you know british culture is not a desert nomad culture it just, it just isn't so if you bring your desert nomad you know behaviors you know here maybe you don't your family don't live in a desert anymore but and you don't realize you have a desert nomad culture and that's why you do what you do. And that's why you have these these traditions. And nobody remembers why you do that. But you just that's what you do. That's mm. what you do. And it's turned down the instinct in areas and turned it up in areas. You bring that somewhere else and, and you are uh alien. And it and it's and it's tricky to survive in uh with your behaviors in that different culture.
you worked with did did I read somewhere a, a senior Canadian politician? Mm. Was, it, was it Stephen Harper? Or was it? I have worked with Harper. Yeah. Um, what do the political classes? What did they want from you? Yeah, that's really interesting. Same same as any other human being, they've hit they've hit a wall. Like it's tough. I wouldn't do it. It's nuts. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, you think, yeah, you know, like everybody hits a wall at some point. Everybody's mm. going at some point. If if they're people who go, I want the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and there could be more for me, and and that's not greed, though it could be. It's just they're that kind of driven person where they see something that needs fixing or needs to be better, and they think they know the answer, and they do or they don't. But but there's very few other people going, I know the answer. The competition is is a small pack. And when you look at that competition, you go, is that are, they, are those the competitors? Like, yeah, those are the, all the people that held up their hands and said, I'll give it a go. And I think I know what to do. You've got this small pack in competition, and they think they know they can make it better. And only time will tell, because you don't know. I mean, you can have you can have a thesis on it. And usually in politics, that thesis is based on um a set of values. That are that are very, um, a very uh, set, and so and so you know somebody's somebody's leader for you is 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 the complete enemy because they don't hold the same values. But anyway, they hit this wall, and they go, you know, they just go, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to perform. They don't know how to talk. They don't know what to do with their bodies. They don't, and 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 their whole world is like like a. a a social media comments feed. <laughs> it's like it's like they're being hit everywhere by everyone. By everyone. Mm. I mean, and on everything, on everything. What they said, how they look, what their weight is, their hair. Do they look well? Do they look ill? Mm. Are they are they an idiot? Are they the brightest person ever? They're being hit by by everything. And what you have there is just like this human being. Going, I just wanted to make. Th I think I thought I knew what to do, and I just wanted to make things better. Anyway, I'm the guy in the room who can be left alone with them, and they can go. I'd be like, "What do I do?" Like, they, you know, they all say that I'm fat. I don't like it. They'll <laughs> <laughs> say I put on weight, and I didn't. I don't want them to be thinking about that. I need to be thinking about the country. Plus, they have their kids reading all of this stuff as well. You know, it's they, they, their family are reading all this stuff. Did the actual, the, the, the microscopic analysis of their physical, physical features uh, and right. what they wear. I right. mean, wasn't Theresa May? Weren't, weren't they constantly talking about her shoes and, and all this kind of stuff? All the time. All the, like <laughs> all the time. All the time. And and look, you, you know, it's not that we we don't know this is going to happen. The human beings are going to do that. We're going to do that. Mm going to do that because we're looking because look like how do i know whether the policy is going to work or not what do i know like mm. i'm pretty smart and i understand politics and you tell me a policy like you tell me a policy at that policy level like okay describe to me the policy what has the bureaucrat written mm. yeah and my brain's going to go well who knows whether this is going to work i don't know there's so many factors it's it's very complex what's going on here so, so us as the general public, what have what sometimes what have we got other than well, I don't like her shoes. I mean, how could she run a country in those shoes? Mm. <laughs> you know, the next day going, well, those are good shoes. I think I like a woman who wears those shoes, and that's that's the woman for me. Mm. So, <laughs> don't they employ teams of people to advise them on the the nuance, the, the tiniest, the, what they wear at the highest levels, right? Gosh, you'd you'd hope, wouldn't you? But no. No. So, so. Okay. So, <laughs> so it is so much, especially at certain times, you know, in the political calendar, it is so much more amateur than you would hope. And that's probably quite a good thing. Mm. When it gets to elections, in my experience, when it gets to elections, anywhere I've been in the world to do this, it becomes about grass, what they call grassroots, mm. which is actually a very small amount of people who are, who are, you know, they have other jobs. And then they become, you know, the people kind of running the party. And it's, I mean, 
it's there, there are some very odd people mm. involved in in that very odd people it's like wow you're in charge of this like like i i can't understand what you like you're not good at getting on with people like you're not a good communicator Richard most... Nixon was notoriously, uh, he didn't do small talk and he was notoriously bad with humans. Right. And that's the person Disagreed. that the people who are running the party have put forward as, so there's our guy, like mm -hmm. he's good, like he's really good with the people. Well, imagine what they're like. Um, imagine the level that that they're at. So a man, and, and they've got the budget, they've got the money, they're the bag, the bag people. So they've got the bag. Mm. And so imagine going to them and going, well, I think what we should be doing is hiring somebody to look after, you know, the shoes and somebody to look after the makeup. And, you know, we need somebody on the hair all the time. And let's let's go shopping and get some really nice clothes. You know, let's 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 suit this person out really, really well. They're like, well, you want to spend money on that for? I mean, mm. you know, we've got a limited budget here <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and they're, they're doing the numbers. They're going. They're not necessarily thinking of the complexity of the of the of the picture. Mm. So yes, you would you would hope probably for you know if you're somebody who who has a party in mind and they go well you know I would like that that team to win and so that's my leader. You would hope that behind them is this propaganda machine that is that is filled with the best of the best that are going to get your person to win and i would have to disappoint you to go it's it's utterly it's utter amateur hour it's like you wouldn't if you're a professional in it you go in there and you and you go you, you're gonna say what you say well, no you can't say that don't say that it's like no look hang on let me write something down look say do that say that instead no, do, mm. no take off Okay, look, take off that jacket. Look, get him another jacket. Get another jacket. It's like mm. it is, it is kick, you know, kick and scramble to get this thing to get, you know, the amount of times that I've <laughs> I've gone, look, okay, we're gonna go shopping. We're gonna go shopping, and here's who we're gonna go and see, and it'll be super easy for you. We we're gonna kit you out in stuff that looks great on camera. We've got 4K, there's gonna be 4K cameras out there. Every detail will be seen and it will be judged. And we can get across an idea about you that fits the idea of for the country. And it can be in the weave of the cloth because they will see, they will see that and it will have meaning. It will have meaning to them. And it's like, they haven't got the money for the shopping. <laughs> haven't got the money for the shopping and so they go on with that with the the salesman you know the the, the bad idea of the salesperson suit mm. on there and it's like mm. what a dude what a disaster well you 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 picked on, up on this before very famously in the with prince andrew interview yes. with emily nagelis um yeah where you you're able to spot uh, his knee <laughs> His knee bouncing, around. and as he <laughs> yeah. became more and more antagonized, maybe uh, d disrupted, his yeah. knee would start bouncing. It was just, it was beautiful. Um, and, and plus, you picked up on his and what he was wearing, and you picked up on what Emily Maitlis was wearing, the kind of military yeah. garb. Um, yeah. And you, you feel you, you, you that that was deliberate. That was yes, I think so. I mean, I, I've, I've since um, heard a. Uh, watched a fantastic interview with with Maitlis. Maitlis is, by the way, you know, a, in my mind, a, a complete, you know, goddess of the interview scene. I mean, like a, you know, a deity in there, J just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Mm. Um, and what was really interesting was to hear just how disrupted she was about this interview. For somebody who who was saying, you know, normally. She'd do any interview and and know that you know there's gonna she understands the the severity of 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 any interview or or the 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 stakes let's say she's a pretty confident woman I mean you you know you'd think so and she she has a confidence she owns a confidence about her her work and her skill mm. I think she was saying in this one you know all bets were off it was like she had the real jitters she would normally you know pack a few clothes to choose from she packed she's she's packed everything like she hasn't made the decisions yet you know this is she she's 
this clearly has struck her at a, a level of, of risk that's way above what she normally does. And so therefore, you know, I, I'm, I feel a little even more vindicated only you know, above my own assessment to say that whatever she was doing in that interview was a choice. And she'd, she'd have gone through a number of choices. She was probably choosing from a way bigger palette than she would normally choose from on everything that she was choosing to do there. Because mm -hmm. I think this was a disruption to her normal patterns of of the kind of interview that she does. She said, she, she said like, I knew I got one chance. There was one chance at this to get, to get the answers. And her choices about following the story and trying to keep to the 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 strategy she had of just follow the story follow the facts and and you know and to the next one and to the next one and therefore i ask this question and therefore i ask this question mm. and and just that my guess would be like the dedication to her decisions to be able to stay on track in that because everything that that Andrew is doing and everything that's been set up there although the, you know she, her team had had some control and were trying to keep control there's another bigger control mechanism going on there which again Connor like eons long mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean mm -hmm. thousands of years of control mechanisms well you're talking buckingham palace yeah. right, which is which is designed to intimidate i mean Absolutely. you must intimidate the interviewer but she wasn't or at least she wasn't to be. she was i mean she didn't appear to be and mm -hmm. and you know is, does that intimidate what's interesting for me her non-intimidation or seemingly non-intimidation does that come from confidence no it came from decision making and it came from getting a strategy together and holding on to your strategy not for, not from like well i'm i'm good at what i do so this will be the same uh and that that heartens me because i i'd hate to live in a world where confidence is something that you're given mm. i mean that, you know that you're that's from some deity or something it's like well i'm gonna give connor confidence like you know mark gets none <laughs> it's like that's no that's no good i want to learn how to do confidence you i know? think it's very very important what you just said there mark about confidence coming from strategy um which right. strategy comes from planning Right. So it all comes from the plan and stick in, in, in whatever capacity, whether you're an executive in, a, in the corporate world, whether you're a politician standing up in front of 5,000 people, the plan and the strategy, once you're rooted in the plan and the strategy, whether it's public speaking or whatever yeah. you're doing, it, it comes from that from that space. And yeah. um, let me ask you about the corporate world. Um, um, there's a couple of things that you have you have you have indicated in, in how people should conduct themselves and shown how people should conduct themselves in zoom meetings yeah and there's great stuff that you've you've shown people what to do we we are now working in a hybrid world in the corporate space so you're doing two to three two to three days a week remote in your own zoom meetings can you just give people again a couple of pointers i know what they are but just for for people who are coming to this for the first time what they should be mindful of in Zoom video meetings. Yeah, lovely, lovely. And so, for anybody who's who's uh, watching this as well, I will take I will take what you're doing, Connor, and describe what people should do through what you're doing because you're doing a great a great job of it. You look, for example, how big you are in the frame. <laughs> yeah, like your your head and your shoulders shot is taking up, you know, a good. Um, a good third of the frame at, at, at least, which means I'm not having to do so much work to find you. Like it shouldn't be my, it's not hide and seek. <laughs> it's communicate. So, so in the moment you make my brain look for you, then you've used up neural load and that new, it's a zero sum game. I only have so many neurons. OK, and if you use my brain for something, you can't use it for something else. Like if you want me to take on a new idea, you know, that might be a little bit alien for me, like don't take up my brain with other stuff, other crossword puzzles. OK, so you're strong, <clears throat> clear in the frame for me. 
which is which is lovely. Now let's look around the frame there because my brain goes, okay, so I've got Connor here, and it and it goes, so who is Connor? Can I trust Connor? Can I not trust Connor? And the brain goes, well, <clears throat> I don't know, I don't know who Connor is. But what you've done is you've left symbols around you, which which you know you probably probably there's some some choices in there you know, that that are going to help me understand, do you hold the same values as me? Because if you hold the same values as me, you're part of my group, part of, part of my tribe, shall I say. And therefore, <clears throat> I owe you trust. Like I'm, I'm bound to you by, by trust and vice versa. So there you are, very clear up there is sapiens. Up in the which which you can you know if I hadn't have read that you would probably be surprised. <laughs> you go, Mark, you haven't read Sapiens. Like, what's going? On? What's going on? Probably you know one of them in 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 my in 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 my area and adjunct to that. You know, one of the most interesting important books for a long long time. Okay, so the moment you put up that, my brain goes, okay, yeah, good guy, yeah, yeah, we, he'll be all right. He knows what he's talking about. This is fine. This is this is good. This is great. So an indicator there of, of shared uh, values. Now, the other thing you're doing is you're bringing your hands into the frame. Yeah, you're making sure that your gestures are up. Now, just like me, you're probably using the table as a, a prop in front of you, which makes the whole call a little less tiring. Yeah, but it means that our hands can be up in frame and showing these baton gestures, these gestures that conduct along to the rhythm of our speech. Um, uh, literal illustrator gestures, which kind of draw a picture of what we're saying. Again, helps your brain understand. Um, you know, so when I say, when, I, when I, I can give you that pinch gesture, or when I say big, I can do a big wide gesture, or when I say small, I can do a compression uh, gesture. So we've got those in there uh, as well. So you can see the gestures that help describe uh, and understand and then there's the things which are non-verbal, but not necessarily visual. Like I can hear that you have a, 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 a good mic and it's up close. And therefore my brain isn't having to do so much work dealing with the distortions of sound that inevitably happen by moving digital information over long distances at a very cheap rate, mm -hmm. essentially. You know, this mm -hmm. is a very... Although this is a, you know, Zoom is genius. One of my clients, by the way, fantastic client. Uh, so, so Zoom is genius. <clears throat> they are finding ways to to send the signal cheaply, else it would be all too expensive, and not everybody in the world could be on it all at once, as as we can be, as the system, you know, will allow us to do. So, so you're doing your best to collect the information, yeah, knowing that it's a lot of brain power. If if I have to undistort your and actually my visual cortex will get used to 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 undistort sound and therefore new ideas won't be able to enter into my head. So, I mean, I hope that gives you some idea of, of some of the things, you know, be big in the frame. Let people see more of you, especially your gestures put indicators around you to help people understand that you hold some similar values uh, to them. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. and one last thing, like you're doing very well at getting eye contact with me. Now, eye contact changes from, from society to society, group to group, culture to culture. There is one thing similar about all of it, that all eye contact is about value. Our eyes go to the things of value. Hmm. If there's something not of value and something of more value in the room, our eyes will go to the thing of value and forget the thing of not value. Now, then whether we keep eye contact with that or not, that's cultural. Hmm. That's cultural. Like if there, there could be some, we might go to a, a, a religious society where you must first of all look at the icon and then avert your eyes from it and never look at it again. First of all, you got to look at it. You don't knock it, not look at it. You look at it and then you avert your eyes. Some cultures, you do that with the people top of the hierarchy. You look first and then avert your eyes. Some cultures, you look and you keep on looking. But it's all about value. So because you're, you're focusing with your eyes very clearly for me, it helps me understand or think, oh, Connor thinks I'm of value. I'm the thing of value here. That sends up my dopamine levels. I get more optimistic. 
I get more confident. Now, what do I do with that feeling of confidence that I have? I project it onto you. And I say, Connor is confident. How do I know that? I don't know that. I feel that and I project it onto you. I have no idea. You could leave this, this, um, this interview going, guy, you know, I was really worried about that interview with Mark. I would have no idea because I felt confident in it. Why? You gave me that. You gave me that feeling and I projected it back onto you. Hope that makes sense to you, Connor. It does. And there's another thing you gave me, um, the Logitech Brio. Oh, yeah. 4k yeah. so i bought bought this based on mark's recommendation it sits at the top of the la laptop right here and you can actually get a visual for everybody watching this you can get it you can get it right in your face sits on top of the laptop and whoever you're talking to sees you i'm also sitting in front of the mirror mark is absolutely right i've chosen to fill the frame with those particular books um some people will like them some people Don't won't and then I'm, I'm trying to do some of Mark's gestures as well because I've learned so much. <laughs> but um, yeah, so for Zoom meetings, there's a number of things there. Natural light or the lighting, like, like, like you said, you can yeah. buy one for 50 euros. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, another thing in the corporate world that people will be dealing with, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Alain de Botton. And um, one oh, of yeah. the, the ideas that he, he phrased was, he coined was status anxiety. Yeah. Right. I want I always I wanted to get your perspective on on status anxiety, um, whether it's you're going on Dr. Phil or whether you're standing in front of, you know, you're talking to a president or members of the G7 or whether you're talking to you're just walking around an office in Google or something. Yeah, this thing, this status anxiety exists. It's real. It's palpable. How do you handle it what, what's your perspective uh, well you know so i i would put that 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 status anxiety in an area of like kind of performance anxiety or um uh what else the, what else is it often uh called i can't remember the name the other name that it's often called anyway here, here's often the way i wake up of a morning <laughs> like oh no what have you done now what have you done to yourself now? Because I know I've got that meeting and I've now gone past that ceiling that I was formerly at. I got comfortable. Like I got, mm. okay, you work with prime ministers, you do this, you do that. You know, people who are running Fortune 500 companies, you know, CEOs of top 10 companies in the US. It's like, okay. And then you and then you get that call and the meeting comes up and you go, now, now you've really messed it up because they will see you they you know these people will see this person will see past you you know and they'll imposter see imposter syndrome imposter Sorry. syndrome thank you imposter yeah. syndrome like like they will see that you have nothing nothing <laughs> and so and what is that you know what is that of, now i take heart because you know i've worked with with multi Olympic gold medalists who have who have imposter syndrome and I'm there like going look literally you have you know two gold medals around you've got this piece of metal that says you're the best in the world you know and it strikes me that the people who are the the top performers get the most performance anxiety so at least it helps my, let's call it ego a bit to wake up in the morning going, well, maybe it's because I'm really good. Actually, maybe it's because I'm really good. But but then that doesn't help for very long. Because still yet, the brain is going, you don't know what's going to happen in there. You've never been in this situation before. You don't have any data that says this is going to go well. So now we're going to catastrophize. Mm -hmm. And we're going to say, this is going to go, this is going to end your life and your career right now. Yeah, because my instinct wants to get me out of it, get me out of it. So what I have to do is, is, is first of all, I cannot, um, I cannot think my way out of it with an opposite idea of going. Well, hey, you know what? I'm the best in the world at this. So, so shut up. You know, devil on my shoulder or angel on my shoulder, however you want to, you know, you know. Uh, put Jiminy Cricket there, but, <laughs> but essentially, <laughs> it's a super ego, I think, uh, is going, is going, um, yeah, I can't, I can't talk to Jiminy Cricket and try and out, out argue Jiminy Cricket, 
because it's like it's 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 core uh it's instinct uh you can't shut it down apart with some apart from with some lethal injections so we aren't we're not going there so but what i can do is say thank you very much like I, I, that's that that in the right place that would be really helpful so i can go in the right place that would be really helpful i'm not sure this is the most helpful place for this right now because i've i've signed up for this and i've got this value that says if i say i'll do it i will do it so so i say thanks very much for your help and your advice on that i'll, I'll be going to do it I'll, I'll be going to do this yeah now that doesn't stop it, it mm. just helps the part of me the values part of me that says if you said you will do it you will show on time and you will deliver yeah mm -hmm. and that's an important value for me now, at the same time, how am I going to manage this anxiety? I'm going to do the behaviors of confidence. And I'm going to do it for them. Because that client, whoever they are, way above the ceiling that I've worked at before, they have a problem. I've got to remember that they didn't have to take this meeting. They chose to take this meeting. It means they have a problem. And their hope is, is that I can fix it. I can help them. So I owe it to them to go in and help. And part of my help is for them to see somebody who they believe is confident. And therefore, you know, the, the medicine is more likely to be taken and, and to be helpful. Now it's good medicine. I'm not, it's not snake oil. Like the stuff works. Mm -hmm. I, I only do stuff that I'm able to go, this will work and this will work immediately. And you will do it like do it or don't do it. If you do it, things will get better. If you don't do it, they won't. I can't control you. Be my guest. Do whatever you like. You're a big person. You get to make your choices. But if you do what I say, this is going to work. So, so, so I go in with that attitude. Yeah, I think attitude. I think it, it is an attitude, but it's brilliant because you've put. You're not obsessing about yourself. You're going in there to offer something and to help. Exactly. It's this inward-looking obsession that 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 helps create. And we're, we're always thinking about, okay, well, everybody's looking at me. Well, no, everybody's not looking at you. Right. You know, it's self-consciousness. Yeah. Self it's being driving. maybe overly self-conscious. Of course, I'm always conscious of myself. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in stressful situations, I can get very, very self-conscious. And I have to go, no, I need to be more other conscious. I have to be so much more conscious, to be more client conscious rather than self conscious and 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 I can do that on purpose I know the behaviors of that I know what somebody does when they're more focused on them than they are on themselves and I just go and do that as a strategy as you say I have a plan and I stick to the plan and and by the way I'll be executing the plan and there'll be all kinds of information coming to me, which I, even as an expert in my field, my brain's going, well, you don't know what that means. You don't know what they meant by that. Look, they just did that. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. This is going to be terrible. This is terrible for you. This is terrible for you. And I'm going, thank you very much. That's very inf interesting information that you're giving me right now. I'm sticking to my plan. I'm going yeah. with my plan. That negative self-talk, that negative self self-chatter can be can be really and it's the there's a there's a wonderful there's a great TED talk that you do where you talk about authenticity. Yeah. Right. And I was imagining you um standing uh, behind the curtain, just about to go on stage and and telling yourself, Oh no, 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 no. And you come out and you have to be confident and you yeah. know you and you deliver. And I think for for anybody that's watching this that's looking to that's thinking about public speaking. And how to do it well you'd have all the craftsmanship is there in that ted talk yeah thank and i'll you. put a link to it um thank you. can you tell me a little bit about it in terms of the authenticity as well i'll put a link to it in the description box you, you talk about authenticity in that can you remember yeah that? yeah so so look, i i've always had a little bit of a problem with authenticity um in that I sometimes think it doesn't mean what people think it means or there or there's there's so many variations of of ideas about it that that it gets a bit mashed up as to what people may or may not mean by it and also the worst thing about it I I felt I would notice a lot of people doing what I called authenticity shaming which was you know if 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 Connor if I didn't like some of the stuff that you were saying what I would be able to do 
is instead of going, hey, Connor, I just don't agree with with the things, you know, your views on this and here's why. And and instead of having a discussion with you, what I'd be able to do is go, well, Connor, I just don't think you're being authentic with me or, or with yourself. And it would it would absolutely stump you because now you've you've got to ex like you've got to explain who you are what you're and, and only you know that and i've come in with i don't think you're being that and like how would i know but if i can set up a culture whereby i can go around saying to people you're not being authentic or i can say to somebody else by the way when you listen to connor watch out because he's not authentic at all it's like that is such spurious nonsense <laughs> spread and I hated, I hated all of that because it was such nonsense, and it, and it and it and it belayed to me or belied to me, so, somebody who wasn't who who wasn't comfortable with just having a conversation, and just <clears throat> putting their own views forward and going, I think this. It's clear that you think this. I don't know whether we'll ever meet on on that one, <laughs> you know. But I'd quite like to discuss it, or like, or like, or like, I, or actually, what I could do, Connor, is go. You're thinking this. I'm thinking this. We do not hold the same values. I don't think we should ever meet again. I mean, it's just not going to, it's just not going to happen. But instead, I'd be going, Connor. I, I mean, just can we next time we meet? I'd just like a little more authenticity out of you, which is really to say, could you agree with me more mm. next time? Because I don't like it not being mm. agreed with. It, it makes me feel awful not being agreed. With. Anyway, I didn't like that about authenticity, in my view. And also there was this, so there was this idea of only authenticity, only being the real true you will ever get you where you need to be. And it's morally the way to do it. Like if you're not being authentic, you are some immoral, um, uh, it, 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 it appeared to me to be religious almost quasi-religious in the same way that I might expect some religious people, but not all to come up to me and go, well, Mark, if you're not reaching your goals through the way, then you're doing, you're doing it wrong. And I might go, but I'm reaching my goals and my goals are good. Yes, but you're not doing it the way mm. it should be done. You're not doing it authentically. So it became moral. I don't like any of that stuff. So part of it was was a little bit of a rant against that, and also going, look, it's it's the nature of things to be social, to be in a society, that we must co-opt with people who don't hold our values all the time or share all of them, but we must co-opt with them. We must get along. There is a middle way. Well, mm. also we were coming towards the time of of the person who was taking the middle way as being the pariah to everybody. If you weren't extreme this or extreme that or supporting the extreme of that. You were saying, well, I think there's a, you know, there's a deal to be made somewhere. Like you are the absolute enemy. Like you're the enemy of everybody because you will not take a side. And it's like, no, I won't take a side because I think, I think there's a history of agreement, of agreement and and concession, and decide and 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 you know making a deal. I think there's a history of making deals rather than having wars whether they be ones with steel blades or culture wars i think there's a there's a history of agreement that served us very very well anyway so so i do this talk about about deciding to perform in such a way that that helps you get on better with people who in your instinct your your authentic feelings you know you shouldn't be dealing with you don't understand, you don't like, or more importantly, you're just disregarding. You're just going, they're going to be nothing. They're not a threat. They're not a friend. They're not a sexual partner. I'm indifferent to them. And, and being inauthentic by going up to more people that you're indifferent to and finding out who they are and finding out what the deal could be with them. I was reminded when I was watching it, Jeff Bezos said recently in an interview that if you were um, somebody who was likely to tell the truth all the time and be your authentic self, it's highly likely you would have got clubbed to death in, yeah. in, in, in the tribe. Um, yeah. yeah. You study deception. Um, have you ever encountered someone so brilliant and cunning and deceptive that it left you impressed? Or is there anybody that... Like so, like you just you go, wow, that guy, that guy or girl is a genius. Can you think of anybody, or is there anybody that was? I actually, uh, caught, I actually, looking... 
Sorry. Yeah, I was actually conned on the street once, conned on the streets of London once. Um, not difficult to get conned on the streets of London. No. Uh, <laughs> but I've caught more than I've I've caught more than I've uh than I've been conned, but there was one where as the guy left up the street, I shouted up, I shouted to him, that was brilliant. You're a genius. And I meant it. <laughs> That was brilliant. And the reason it was brilliant is I thought I'd conned him. That's why it was brilliant. It was a brilliant con because he found very quickly the thing that I was greedy for. Yeah. And he played the con to the extent that as he was leaving, a little voice in my head went, what an idiot. What an idiot. I just mm. got him. And then I went, oh, no, I didn't. He's just come out on top. And I was literally, <laughs> he's now running up the street. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. brilliant. You're a genius. I mean, that was, sticks in my mind so well. Such, so, so brilliant. And I can look back at it and go, yeah, you did this and you made me feel great and you did this and you made me feel great but it but it was a greatness that I was hungry for <laughs> and you you know that was it and in acting and the performing arts and the study of of drama we are we always are taught to try and figure out what does the character want yeah because once you understand what the person wants there's there's an element um that, that you can work with um Last couple of questions. Yeah, sure. What what excites you about the study of behavior and body language? What what's coming down the track? Are you worried about AI? Is there anything that's exciting you or interesting interesting you? Yeah, you know, AI would excite me, although it never gets um it never it's not got good enough yet. Yet. Maybe it could. Yeah. But here's, here's where it's failing. I mean, it's failing at all kinds of technical levels. But here's the, the, the heart of where it's failing and where it can never get. It's not, in terms of AI and analyzing or producing human behavior in a way that I can analyze or produce it, it's not having fun. It's not enjoying it. Mm. It's not, it's not fun. And, and like, I'm having, like, this is a nice hour for me. <laughs> Talking to you about human behavior. Like, this is a nice time for me. And after this, I'll, I'll have to get back to some of the stuff that is, you know, is, is, is my day and stuff that has to be done, you know, for my work and for my business and for my life. And it will be less fun than, than this which for me is talking about human behavior and analyzing it and thinking about it and it's a lot of fun for me mm. and and hopefully it's a lot of fun for you and hopefully people watching and listening they're going well that was a fun that was entertaining you know from medieval latin to hold on to like i held on with mark for for an hour and it was and it was it was um you know it was better than some things and at you know or or, or less worse than others <laughs> you know, made my life a little bit better. And I don't see anything yet in, in AI that is, is investigating or, in, or, or interjecting into human behavior in such a way that I go, that's really good fun. Like we could have a great time with, with that. That's very interesting. That's going to be very, very difficult for AI and the robots to fake that. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and yeah, um, I'm just thinking in terms of how it's worked into customer service, sales, the corporate space, um, how, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. There still will be a human need for human relationships and personal. You know, it brings, brings to mind, there's a, there's a, um, a sales um, uh, uh, trainer out there, Jeremy Miner. And he's so often talks about delivering, um, delivering in a fun way. And he does it very well. He goes, look, you know, I used a really kind of fun tone mm. there, really fun tone. Yeah. But like, how does he define a fun tone? 
And how do I do my fun tone? How do you do your light fun tone? And, and how does an AI produce that tonality? Because it works, like you, you go, yeah, when you use that tone, it's like, I, I feel engaged, I'm pulled in. I'm pulled in on that the story yeah yeah and 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 look we could go look eventually ai will be able to produce the, the funnest fun tone ever and you'll be able to dial up the fun and down the fun and it, yes it's possible it's possible but is it having fun mm. do we trust that it is having fun because there could come a point in legislation where if if i am on in a conversation with an AI, that AI must tell me that they are not human. Yeah, they must tell me that. You know, mm. and so and so. Yes, they can produce a fun tone, but something in my mind goes, "Yeah, but you're not having fun, are you?" It reminds me. Of something. <laughs> I was uh, I was on on customer service to yesterday, and I I thought very kind of cheekily that I was getting. Um, I decided to ask the customer service rep, are you an AI? <laughs> because, because I wasn't getting anything back. I don't know if you've right, ever been right. on a chat bot where you're, you're getting, yes, thank you, Mr. Ryan. I will yeah. answer your question shortly. Um, are you ready to, to, to have the question? <laughs> so I was getting very frustrated because I thought I was talking to an AI, but apparently I wasn't. But um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so last question, what does the future hold for Mark Bowden and the behavior panel? Yeah, lovely. Well, we we put out a, a message yesterday that we have um, we're doing a a show, kind of a sister show to the Behavior Panel um, uh, on YouTube, which we'll always keep doing. But we've got a, a new show on Merritt Street, which is a new uh, US TV network founded by uh, Dr. Phil McGraw. Uh, an hour long show every Friday. We'll start off with. I think it's about four. PMET for ET and uh, it, it's the behavior panel. Well, will it go on YouTube, the, Mark, or will it just be on network? As far as I understand, I mean, you know, as usual, it's, you understand TV and PM, being a perform, former Connor, I'll be the last person to know <laughs> any, of course, yeah. <laughs> anything, anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm the last person they tell. I mean, the news came out yesterday and, you know, it's like, I, I read it. This is it's what we're doing. Yeah. Like, I read it. I read it in the news. As I understand it, we will have a, a YouTube channel that that will show elements or parts of, or maybe even all of those uh, shows. You know, again, I'm not sure of their strategy. I know our strategy at the Behavior Panel, our original YouTube, which is we will keep on making our shows week after week after week, showing up just as we have for probably about the last almost four years now, starting in in COVID. You know, you you started just before COVID, I think, and you got the COVID bound. You no, know, we're always amazed that people want to listen to our, you know, our banter and our interest and our nerding out at this stuff. You know, I, and I I don't think there'll be anybody watching this now that's not familiar with the behavior panel. But if I was to, if I'm an outsider looking at, I, I I would say it's the, the scientific deconstruction of behavior, the scientific analysis of behavior. With yeah. probably a focus on deception, right? If we have to, would, yeah. would it be fair to say? Uh, well, yes, I think so. Because look, the the way that I think the show works is that the drama is not between us. The drama is outside of the room. The drama mm. is the, the 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 crime or the the deception or the the interview of a celebrity where you're going. Did that really happen? I mean, are you really telling us the truth around that? That's all outside of of, of the room for us and the panelists to analyze together and to get on with each other. You mm -hmm. know, having having fun together, uh, looking at these outside situations, some of which are incredibly grave, and some of which are just ridiculously stupid that people would go down that. <laughs> that route you know and everything everything else um in between but it is analysis of behavior so everything that goes across that not only body language what people are saying the context that they come in something of the culture that they come in the micro cultures the mass culture, the history i mean i just love putting stuff within historical context you know and how how we are you know always products of the past 
in some way, you know, hopefully mm. moving forward somewhat, but always products of the past. Yeah, look, I find it, I find it fascinating. It is. And long may I continue. Mark Bowden, thank you so much. It's been oh, an absolute God. pleasure and privilege. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Great to see you.